Hello, everyone. I'm here today with John Lockley. John is an African Zangoma in, in the Kosa tradition of South Africa. And this is the same tradition that we have uh, the likes of Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela as being part of that tribe. So it's a real honor to have John here today to share his wisdom and his medicine and really to speak about the power of um, what he has to share around ancestry and tracking and dreams and much more, I'm sure. Uh, John has written a book called The Leopard Warrior, I believe, and it was the leopard that actually called me to to find John and uh, open the dialogue for this conversation. So, John, thank you so much for being here today with me. It's a joy to bridge with you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. And we are, um, I believe you have Irish ancestry as well, which was uh, another point of uh, note for me with with you know, what you're bringing in terms of your medicine. Is that correct? Yes, yes. My mom is from Dublin. Beautiful, beautiful. So you're you're unifying and bridging a lot of different um, races and traditions, I suppose, with your work. Uh, I suppose, I suppose so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, John, I, what really spoke to me uh, when I started listening to your stories and some other interviews that you've done is how you came to the path of being initiated as a, sang as a Sangoma. And what really struck me was the, the power in people understanding really what a true calling to this kind of work is and what what initiation means and and that calling because I feel like there's such glamorization in the spiritual uh, circles in these days of what a shaman is and also people assuming titles of shaman um, that really are not appropriate titles to to be wielding in the world I feel so I'd love you to just touch upon that initiation for you and um yeah what what it really means to to be initiated in that way if you if you feel called to do that thank you well i think first for the listeners sangwame is an african shaman a traditional african shaman mostly from southern africa so there's a number of countries in southern africa and most of them a lot of them use the term Sangoma for someone who is a, an African traditional healer or, as we would say, a traditional African shaman. So um, in the Sangoma world, in the same as, as many traditional shamanic cultures, you don't decide you want to become a, a shaman or a Sangoma. So my my path started with me going to going to uh, Sangoma for a divination. And um, so basically the way it goes is, is you have a calling through through illness and through dreams, and then it's important to be identified by someone in the culture who then invites you to be their apprentice, and then you train an, an, an apprentice. But uh, we never go looking to become a Sangoma. So you don't go knocking on someone's door and say, train me to become a Sangoma. That's not what happens. Um, right. It's very important to be identified and also to be invited in. So when I went to my teacher many years ago and um, I went for a divination because of a number of reasons, I wanted to have a traditional experience because of all my dreams and I was in South Africa, I'm born and bred in South Africa. So I was in at, at university and my teacher was living in in the village just outside the town. And um, so I asked, I asked someone in the psychology department who was a Kosa man, if he could please take me for a divination with with a Sangwoma in the in the township, which is like the village. And he said to me that he knew someone who was really, really good. And uh, and she'd helped heal his son. So so then we made an appointment and I went the next day. And uh, I just remember my my teacher to be sweeping the front the front lawn and looking after her property and getting ready to to wash the clothes and you know, all these basic things. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she seemed quite stern, you know, and she kind of looked me up and down and 
And then I went in and I sat with her and, um, and then she gave me the divination and it was so accurate. It was so incredibly accurate where she spoke about the last seven years of my life. Mm -hmm. And then she said to me something very remarkable, which I've never forgotten. And she said that she had a dream, had a dream the night before where the great spirit Utiko came to her and told her that she was going to apprentice someone from another culture to become a senior Sangoma like her and that she must prepare herself for this. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then when I came through the gate, she said I was the one. And then when she sat listening to my story and feeling my energy and doing the divination, it was clear for her that I was the apprentice that she had dreamt about. So um, she said to me, I dreamt about you the night before. And, uh, and the great spirit has called me to apprentice you. And then she said, do you want to be my apprentice? So there again, there's the invitation. Uh, I never went sitting there expecting or hoping to become a Sangoma. Mm -hmm. And I said, what does it mean to be a Sangoma? And she said, to be a Sangoma means you're going to stop being so sick and you're going to be able to heal people in different ways. The ancestors are going to move through you and you're going to be able to heal people in different ways. Mm -hmm. So she said to me again, do you want to become my apprentice? Do you want to become a Sangoma? So then I thought for a moment and I said, yes, yes, that sounds good to not be sick and to be able to heal people in different ways. So then she said, okay, wonderful. We'll, we'll come tomorrow and then I'll give you your first white beads. And these beads will be a sign that you are my apprentice and that you have started the, the initiation process. So you've started the twaza. The twaza meaning that you are a, an initiate in the school of Sangoma. So, uh, so I said, wonderful, thank you. And that's, that's what happened. And then it was 10 years, 10 years of, uh, of, of training. I wasn't living with them for 10 years the whole time. I would often have to go overseas to work mm -hmm. because the apprenticeship process is expensive in terms of all the ceremonies we have to do. So we have to do a number of different initiation ceremonies. And during that time, I would just rest and just be in the community. So I had to earn a living. And mm -hmm. um, part of the time was also living in Ireland, as we just shared, where I was living in Galway. Yes. And I was teaching, teaching yoga in Galway. And in that way, I was bridging my, my mother's ancestors who are Irish. And uh, I was bridging my, my family line, the Kellys, which is a big, was a big grouping of Irish people. And um, I'm also an Irish citizen and have an Irish passport. So oh, it's my okay. second nationality. So in some ways, it was fitting in, and right for me to also live in Ireland. And um, so during those years, I would dream the ceremonies that I had to perform. And I'd often dream those ceremonies while I was in Ireland. And, uh, and then I'd phone my teacher or phone her, her family because she doesn't speak English. And then I'd go back to South Africa and live there for a number of months, very close to her. Mm -hmm. and, and this went on for, for 10 years. So um, part of the process was bridging different cultures. So bridging... Irish culture, bridging traditional also African culture and uh, and learning different ways. So a Sangoma, or you could even say a traditional shaman is someone who has to learn to bridge the different worlds and different realities in this world because of different cultural differences between people, but also in the spirit world. And the initiation process that we go through is is I have to say quite arduous and um, I can't go into details because of confidentiality, but I can just say that, uh, that there are a number of different rituals and ceremonies that we have to do in order to complete the training. So there's the beginning of the training, there's the middle, and then there's the end where you are made what we call which means a senior Sangoma who has the who has the, the right and blessing of the elders to then train other people to become Sangormas. So that's a very, a very wonderful and also very responsible position to mm -hmm. be given that title of Likbachankulu. 
and being able to then baptize and trans and offer the transmission mm. of the Sangoma lineage to the next generation. So, so that is what, what happened to me. I've been offered that after the final ceremony in 2007. And it was really amazing because I was one of the first white people after apartheid to be given that title in that particular area. Um, and then now there's a number of white people who have come through the training and apprenticeship in South Africa now, which is wonderful. But in those days, it was, it was still quite unusual. And, um, and, in, and in some ways, I suppose it is still unusual because there's not, I wouldn't say a lot of people that go through this process uh, in terms of white people. So uh, um, the reason why I went through it, I have to say, is because the calling was so strong and is so strong for me in the mm -hmm. sense that I wouldn't feel well inside me and emotionally or, or spiritually or psychologically unless I did the ceremonies. So the ceremonies were calling me. And the process of the ceremonies involves cleansing with plants, doing the trance dance, doing very powerful prayers, and bringing yourself into a place of humility, we say Tobeka. Mm. And then the ancestors come and reveal themselves in different ways. And uh, for the listeners, when we say ancestors, we mean spirits or spirit guides. Right. But we, we, as African people, we see the doorway of the of the spirit realm being held by your blood and bone people so that's why blood ancestors is so important because in the western world nowadays there is a lot of people bereft in terms of spiritually so they might have money or they might be able to buy iphones and technology but their spiritual or soul energy is is quite low so mm -hmm. they have low spiritual self-esteem but they have mobility and the means to be able to buy technology and, and live in the Western world, but they are bereft spiritually. Um, so, so this is what I've found. And um, that process of connecting to your ancestors is also the doorway to those spirits and your spirit guides. They hold that doorway, you know, so that's mm -hmm. why the ancestral work is very, very important. Yeah, I feel it's it's the most critical work that we can do right now, mm -hmm. really. Um, so for you, for for in that um, respect, John, with the ancestors, our blood and bone ancestors that are holding that door, how do you recognize or do you recognize if some of them are unhealed ancestors or, you know, when we are caught, when you are calling in the ancestors um, and inviting them in, are there ones that you've dealt with where there's difficulty with those ancestors in your experience with certain ancestors? So the rule of thumb when you're calling in your ancestors, it's like you're having a party. So just imagine you're having a party in Galway. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're having a party, do you just say you just want well people to come? You don't want people no. who are sick. You don't want people who are handicapped. No, of course not. Yeah. So I, I want you yeah. to really feel this. Yeah. It's very, very important. When you invite someone to a party in Galway, Kinvara, do you mm -hmm. just invite healed and well people? I'm asking you. No, your heart extends. My heart would extend to all beings. To, to so all why people. would you yeah. why would you use that with your ancestors? Why would you use that? What you just asked me. With I ancestors? suppose let me rephrase that because I uh, yeah. <laughs> Because that sounds actually terrible. Because um, this is a very common yeah, practice yeah. in the West. And I'm not saying that people are right or wrong, because that's not my job. Okay. I'm just using old ways of practice, the way I was taught in the way we did it in the village and in the townships and traditional areas of South Africa. Yes, We would never, ever, ever yeah. say, I just want those well ancestors to come through. And let me tell you why. Because often... The sick ancestors come through us in order for us to heal them. It's yes. not about what we can get from our ancestors, is what we can offer to them to heal them. And that's why there's so much spiritual and soul um, poverty mm. in the Western world, because the mindset is consumerism. It's what can I get? 
And yes. we have to change that mindset spiritually if we want to heal this world, because it's not about what you can get. Mm. It's about what you can give. So if you look at Ireland, incredible poverty. Yeah. Until very recently, until the 90s, where money came into the country. And I know the story of Ireland intimately because my mother is 87 years old and is brought up in the old Irish way. So I asked her one day when she was walking in the streets of Galway, I said to her, Mom, how do you find it now? Because there was the hustle and bustle and the wealth and everything else. And, um, and she can see how Ireland has changed so much. Yeah. And she said, ah, sure, John. She said, in the past, we had no choice. We had the church and we had the government and everyone was telling us what to do. Ah, you can go here. Ah, I can go there. And, and we had no choice because we were poor. Now people have money and they have a choice. They have a yes. choice to be humble or they have a choice to be arrogant. They have a choice to be greedy have a choice to help other people she mm -hmm. says island is great because we all have a choice now so when we are working with ancestors we have a choice how do we how do we operate with them how do we engage with them but from an ancient culture in south africa mm -hmm. from the Prosa people from mandela's people what i can say to you is when you are inviting in your ancestors you never just say I want the well people. I want those who aren't alcoholics. I want those who haven't had TB. I want those who are happy. I want those who are not depressed. You never, ever, ever do that. Yeah. You yeah. say, I welcome you all. And yes. Yes. I praise you for surviving mm. so that I can be here today. Because, you know, the pain in Ireland, mm -hmm. a lot of people are experiencing that spiritually now because their parents and grandparents and great grandparents were not able to experience that because of poverty. They were yeah. in survival mode and they were in survival mode for over 800 years because of colonization, yes. because of, 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 of what happened in terms of English occupation. And, and that is real. These things are very real. So once yeah. you get to a, a family grouping where the people are suddenly okay and they don't have to worry about getting food for their children and education and all of that, mm -hmm. then all those old memories of pain start to surface. And we have to identify that as, is it your personal pain? Is it the pain of your own um, life and your own story? Or is it ancestral pain that's coming up? And for a lot of people, I feel um, there's this confusion between ancestral pain and personal pain. Mm -hmm. And the way we heal that ancestral pain is to feel it and light a candle to our, to our ancestors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I absolutely received that, John. And yeah, I suppose my question was... The way that came out, I'm glad that that has stirred that because that needed to be spoken. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I'm deep in the work of ancestral uh, reconciliation and healing uh, myself and, and mm. steeped in it. Um, and my question was more around the way you you're calling in your ancestors and how you reconcile, I suppose, those 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 parts of the ancestry that need that love, um, how, how, you, how you do that in your tradition? Well, it's different from each person. So even in the Sangoma tradition, even in the same village, you're going to have, and even in the same family of Sangomas, you're going to have people working slightly differently because of their relationship to their spirits. We could say yes. their ancestors. So first you appease mm -hmm. your blood ancestors and you, you make an offering to them, and then you watch and see what comes from there, what comes through the doorway. So it's like a doorway, and you can just imagine it's a doorway, you know, it's got left and right, and male and female, and you make an offering to the doorway. Literally, you make an offering to the, to the door as we're opening um, the sacred space. And then we watch and listen to our dreams, and we see what ancestors come through. Um, I've heard situations where sometimes there are sick ancestors that have come through and even where there's been an argument between two different spirits or two different ancestral groups yeah. and, um, and that has come through in the dreams. And then we do a ritual to, 
to 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 deal with that so it's a bit like mindfulness meditation you you feel the the energies that are coming up and then you you deal with them in terms of the breath but mm -hmm. in this case it's it's doing a ritual where we invoke in all the ancestors and then we invoke the great spirit mm. and then we talk about what we are seeing in terms of maybe disharmony between the ancestors and then we call on harmony and we call on peace and then we do, we, we deal with it um so it's different from person to person so all i say to people is is love your ancestors love the people you come from mm. you know and the more people love their ancestors, then we're going to have less conflict in the world in terms of human conflict. Because human conflict between different groups of people, the root of it is disharmony in the family. Because if you love your family, you love where you come from, you, you're not going to really want to attack and hurt other people if it's genuine love, you know? That's so true. So to answer your question, it's on a case by case basis. What we do is we love all our ancestors and we invoke them. And then we watch to see what comes through the doorway okay. because it's different. And each person has a different spiritual development. Mm. So for one person, they might have, um, let's say alcoholic ancestors coming through who are full of like, 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 um, like heavy energy, which is going through the initiate, going through the person who's dreaming. And mm. then they bring that story to the teacher and we listen to that and then we'll go, okay, we need to do some ceremony here. So then we will do a, a series of ceremonies based on that and also cleanses. So physical mm -hmm. cleanses. And what we do with that ancestor to a sick, we appease them. We tell them they are safe, that they are welcome. And we ask them, how can we help you? Mm -hmm. And then we offer them food and we offer them cleansing herbs. And then we also invoke the great spirit and other ancestors to assist them. Mm -hmm. So it's basically an, an English language or Western language. You could say that we invite them to face the light, you know, face the setting sun. Yes. But we don't do it in, in that particular way because that's some, I don't want to go into semantics, but in essence, that's what we do. But the way we do it is we invite in all the ancestors. We invite in the great spirit and, um, and we tell that, sick ancestor who maybe has some some kind of uh, problem when they're alive like maybe alcoholism mm -hmm. we tell them that they are that they are safe that they are loved that they are here and uh, and what can we do to help them yeah mm. it's beautiful thank you John. because if 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 we only want to invite well ancestors then we are just perpetuating yeah. the situation that we are having in the world right now in the physical waking world because the dream time or the spirit world is mirroring this world and this world is also mirroring the, the, the spirit world so in order for us to have more of a, a magical experience as human beings um, as you know in Ireland it's got a very magical history for us to maintain the magical history of the land and island and to go deeper with it Mm -hmm. We need to go deeper with our spiritual practice. We need to go deeper with ancestral practice and open these spaces and these portals so this ancient wisdom can come through unencumbered, without judgment and without discrimination. Mm -hmm. That's very important, unencumbered, without judgment and without discrimination based on health, color, culture, any of that, you know? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Received and heard <laughs> deeply. <laughs> and the ancestors and we also are, have are to laugh. We can't, Yeah. We also have to yeah. laugh. And this is the one thing I love in Ireland is the medicine of humor, the medicine yes. of music and the yeah. medicine of humor. Because sometimes when people get into deep shamanic work or ancestral work, people are always worried um, in the West, especially about um doing the right thing doing the right thing and i always yeah. say don't worry about that just be playful and be loving and and have the right intention and a lot of good medicine can come from that because we can do these very intensive ceremonies in south africa and my friends and my sangoma elders are very focused 
but they're also incredibly playful and very compassionate. And that playful energy is actually the juice and electricity behind the medicine. <laughs> yes, isn't that so true? It is. It's so uh, important, yeah. It is, it is. For sure. And and it's definitely alive here in Ireland. There's a lot of trickster uh, elemental energies that that make sure you laugh at yourself if you're getting too serious. For sure. Um, wow. Well, you know, I love that, John. And I, I presume then for you, like somebody could come to you and, and do a personal uh, session with you around healing the ancestors and go deeper uh, with with practices with you if they wanted to. Is that right? Yes, yes, yes. I do a lot of private sessions around this. And I'm also doing a seven-week course with a shift network, which is starting in a couple of weeks. Yes. So it's a seven-week course on ancestral healing and aspects of, of how to heal our ancestors. And uh, all people need to do is go onto my website, johnlockley.com, and, and you'll see the, the, the upcoming seven-week course there. Beautiful. And that is that held in a live container, John, or, or is it recorded? Yes, that's uh, that's that's online. So it's recorded. Right. And um, so I'll be sitting with people every week like I'm sitting with you and yep. um, and that will be recorded and there will be homework and 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 it'll be held in a particular way, the way the shift network does it, which is very good. And um, yeah, it's very worthwhile. So I do recommend it for anyone who's interested in healing their ancestors or interested in, 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 in African shamanism or mysticism or dreams. This is a, a very, this is my first course that I've done like this online after 25 years of being a Sangoma. So, um, so it's very historical for me and very auspicious. So I, I welcome, I welcome all the listeners to, to, to join me on this course. Beautiful. Great Especially my Irish, my Irish family, you know. Yeah, there, <laughs> exactly. You. Get the call out to to the Come Irish. Join me. Don't be afraid. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because well, after yeah. all, I am a Kelly. I mean, well, I'm a there Kelly. you go. What I know. I, say? <laughs> I, the, <laughs> I well, so do you feel like people are afraid, like that there is a, a fear around um, uh, yes. perceptions of yes. of African yes. shamanism? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. People are afraid of African shamanism. People are afraid of ancestors. People are afraid of themselves, and people are afraid of their shadows. <laughs> yeah, oh, all of the above. <laughs> and then you say, "Ah, oh, she's give me a drink," you know, because oh, oh my God, God, this is too much here. It's too much. <laughs> I can't deal with it. Oh gosh. So, well, um, you know. So yeah. all I can say is, Amen. I hear you. You know, I was yeah. afraid during my training, but I was also full of joy. And the mm. fear we have to distinguish fear that is fear that is is the doorway to you connecting with your personal power and there's going to be some fear to that and it's a bit of fear like i don't know if any of you um i don't know if people have experienced playing sport but i remember when i used to do to to run in athletics at school and and play competitive sport and there's always a little bit of fear before the race started and I used to love the 800 meter race. I used to love it. And it was difficult. You had to be really fit. And yeah. there's always this, this, these nervous tension before the race started, you know. And afterwards, when the race is over, you go, oh, thank God, that was amazing, you know. <laughs> so it's a bit like that with, uh, with deeper ancestral work. And mm -hmm. when the work is serious, there's going to be a little bit of fear because it's serious and because mm -hmm. It's that opportunity for you to connect with the real power that you are born with. And a lot of people are afraid of their own power. And sure, didn't Nelson Mandela yeah. say that? He said the biggest problem is people are afraid of their own power. Mm. So the doorway to that power is honoring your ancestors. And that's the same in all cultures, not just Africa. It's all traditional shamanism. It's in sh it's 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 deep in the fabric of Ireland in terms of Celtic mythology and Celtic oh, yeah. spirituality. Yeah. The doorway to the spirit realm is opened through your reverence and just respect to your own people, to your ancestors. Yeah. So don't be afraid, come and join me. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, A ceremony is people joining together in prayer with, from different ancestral groups, from different cultural groups. 
and and it's international, so um, everyone is welcome. Mm. And I'll also be singing songs and chants, and um, you know the system of of earth based shamanism. The system is actually very very simple. It's not complicated. Mm. It's only three things. It's it's you as an individual making a decision to connect to your immortality, to your soul, your, the spirit inside of you that doesn't die. So first you make that decision. And then the second thing, the second gateway is people looking at their life force and how it is created. So then turning to their ancestors and invoking them, mom and dad, male, female. And then the third is that sense of looking upwards and invoking in the great spirit. Mm. So that's all cultures, all traditional shamanic cultures. That's the way it goes. So I'll be going into this yes. with people on my seven course. Yeah, yeah. It sounds <laughs> it sounds amazing. That's yeah, and and it is. It's the recognition, I suppose, of that interconnectivity of all of life. And if any one part is left out, um, it's not going to flow, right? That's right. Yes, that's right. So, so that first, that first pulse, because it's like you're looking at, um, like, like organisms in the sea or any life form, is mm -hmm. that pulse, that life force, that pulse. So it's like your first pulse inside of you is, is you feeling your own heartbeat, and then feeling your intention and feeling your will. Like, do you want to connect to your immortality? Do you want to connect to that part of you that doesn't die, that asks the question of why do I eat every day? Why, what is the purpose of my life? Mm -hmm. If that's an important question for you, then to answer that question means to then honor your ancestors because that's all part of that. So then you honor your mom and dad, and then you invoke the Buddha or the great spirit and and sure, this is how my journey started. And um, mm. so that's, you know, to keeping it simple and not being afraid of fear, but listening to your fear. And is it real? Is it real? Mm. Like, you, are you afraid of something because it's dark and it's evil or it's dangerous? Or are you afraid of something because it's something that's hidden inside of you and it's it's the doorway to your own power and your own mystery? And sometimes people can't distinguish those 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 fears, you know. Mm. Yes, I mean that that void place is a scary place for a lot of people. Um, hence mm. the need to disassociate and find other ways to to uh, avoid it. Yeah, I really, yeah. I really, I really feel that that's that's so powerful. And I love we well we have that tradition here in Ireland, as you know, of going down into the earth and into the mounds and in, in into those places to really connect with that darkness. Um, and I'm mm -hmm. sure you have similar different rituals over there um, in South Africa for connecting with the darkness within yourself. Yes, yes, we do. Yes, we yeah. do. I think mostly once you once you invoking your ancestors, mm -hmm. um, then a lot of feelings can come up. And um, so for us in the traditional way, we don't we don't give too much energy to emotions. Okay, this is quite interesting because it's just accepted that when you're working with ancestors, it's going to be emotional. So we don't give energy to it. So we don't sit down and say, oh, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling anxious. We don't discuss any of that, interesting enough. We don't give energy to it. The only thing is we'll say is, well, you're working with your ancestors, so that's normal to feel all these things. So there's no need to discuss it. <laughs> just, fe just feel it. Yeah, just feel it. And then we'll say it's perfectly normal. To feel angry before a ceremony, it's perfectly normal, but don't take that anger out on someone else. If you're yeah. feeling that anger, then here's some medicinal plants, wash your body with the plants and the herbs and do some prayers to your ancestors and the great spirit. Mm -hmm. But if you suddenly lash out at someone, we're like, no, that's, that's not right. Stop. You know, okay. Okay. so yeah. that those energy, um, as people invoke their ancestors, it can be very emotional for people. Mm. And, um, and you will see with my, with my cross of friends, they will be very emotional. And in their normal day-to-day -day life, they're not emotional. 
but when they are yes. invoking the ancestors, there's this there's this quality of deep, deep tenderness mm. and deep vulnerability that comes in. Mm. And and then there's also this incredible power. So there's two things: deep vulnerability and tenderness, and this incredible power. And you see both. It's like quite incredible. So for those people who are new on the path, all I can say is that is perfectly normal and it's part of being a human being. Just be careful about those emotions because sometimes people go into their emotional body and then they create a story and they say, oh, this work is not right because I'm feeling so upset and oh, my ancestors are this or they're that. Stop. This is normal. You're a human being. You're honoring those people who haven't been honored in the Western world for over 2000 years, you know, Western culture, we used to honor our ancestors. Yes. This is part of the sickness in the, in the, in the Western world. Yeah. So the importance of reconnecting and really yeah. just, yeah, figuring out who you are and loving all of those beings. And maybe would you suggest setting up an ancestral altar or something at home, something simple? Yes. Yes, yes, an ancestral altar is very helpful to yeah. create something with soil and with stones, mm. something which is of the land, because when we die, we're going to become soil and earth. Yes. So it's a good reminder of the practice to have. I have a little, little altar, which is just a plate of soil and, uh, and a candle, and that's it. That's it, you know. Perfect. It doesn't need to be much at all, really. It's. I suppose it's the that's intention, it. yeah. Yeah. Thank you, John. I, I know that there is infinite more around ancestry and that, um, yeah, I really for, for people to dive in more with you in your programs would be phenomenal. Well, I know that you do uh, uh, retreats in the Kalahari Desert. So the tracking with nature, the inner tracking and the outer tracking with the animals. And I'd love you to speak to the importance of that because I'm such a nature advocate um, in my own healing and awakening journey. Um, how that works with people and really the importance of that in these times. Yes, well, we we do a retreat. So I host a retreat in the Kalahari, two retreats. And it's seven days, and the focus of the retreat is is the inner tracking and outer tracking. So the inner tracking is where I take people to a shrine house in the bush, and we go into the shrine for about two hours every day, and that's where I teach them about ancestors and how to connect with their ancestors. And then I give them little assignments to go into nature and to do mm -hmm. some practices around that. And then I teach them about dreams and how to connect with their dreams. Mm. And um, and then we work with medicinal plants and we'd work with, with prayer and with ritual and ceremony. So that's all about connecting to the inner tracking. So the inner tracking is what is your purpose? Why are you here? What is your connection to your ancestors? What are your gifts? And to open up your gifts, to open up your, your spiritual connection but most importantly, to connect to your immortality, to connect to the dreamer inside of you that is connected to all the worlds, mm -hmm. to connect to your soul. So that's what the inner tracking, the focus of the inner tracking is. And, um, and then the outer tracking is much easier. <laughs> <laughs> and the outer tracking is where we follow the animals and we go on walks through the desert for two hours in the morning and then in the afternoon or early evening, we we walk just on foot and uh, in silence and we follow the tracks in the si sand. So we'll follow, we might follow, we might follow cheetah, um, we'll follow all kinds of different antelope and we will just observe them and learn from them because the animals are teaching us. So how can we get back into balance with nature as human beings, we need to listen to the natural world. So that sense of listening needs to be developed a little bit more for us. So mm -hmm. the practice of walking to the bush felt is the practice of like a walking meditation. We, we don't talk much and we listen to the sounds of the animals and then the lead tracker who is a sand bushman and, and then the mm -hmm. other tracker 
these two trackers, they will both point out certain things in the sand and talk about various animals and where they're moving and what they are doing. And as we do that every day, it starts, people start to attune themselves to nature and to what's happening around them. And it's a beautiful practice because that also helps to inform the inner tracking. It helps people to let go. And um, often if, if people are running around in the first world or in the modern world, their central, their nervous systems are, and their adrenals are on over, over, overdrive. Yeah. So as we're walking on the land every day, there's a sense of calmness that starts to descend on people. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that over over amped nervous system starts to calm down, and as that happens, then people start to receive dreams, and they start to connect to their their immortality, to their soul, to their spirit. So um, I'm using that word, the soul and the and the spirit. I suppose that's 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 crosser, but it's also Irish in the sense that. If you read any of John O'Donohue's work from yes. the Nirvana, it's the soul is calling us. Mm -hmm. And that's my Irish mystical side coming through and from my own dreams, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And um, our soul is calling us. And how yes. can we hear the whisper in the wind? How can we hear that amidst the noise of the world? So going to the Kalahari, which is very... It's very natural. It's like going to the Garden of Eden. There's no, there's no uh, buildings. It hasn't been, um, hasn't been tainted in any shape or form. There's no industrialization. Um, there's no industry. It's mm -hmm. like going to a natural place that's been like that for thousands of years, and just being on the land. Yeah, it's like going into the Garden of Eden, and it helps people to to reset themselves to that way of innocence mm. and that way of newness and that way of listening to their spirit. And it changes people's lives. It changes oh, yeah. people's lives. So that's, so I do these retreats every year. You can look at my website. Uh, I do them right. in February and March. Every year I do the dreams and tracking and uh, there's still spaces available. And then right. I do another retreat in May in South Africa, which is a walking retreat. Um, so it's eight days, the one in May, and it's it's three days of of camping and sleeping under the stars, just on a mat and around a little fire. Oh. And and um, but it's a wild area, so there's lions, there's leopards. It's full on wild, okay. and we'll have each we'll have have guard duty, so each person will be given a, a chance to 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 be vigilant to be mm. vigilant and to be on guard for wild animals that might come in. And it's a good practice for people. You know, it's very good practice. And again, it's life changing for people. Yeah. So it's incredible. Amazing. You're definitely going to meet your edges mm. on guard duty. <laughs> if you're holding space yeah. for, for that, that's incredible. Uh, yeah, I feel yeah. the potency of that and also the potency of the organic intelligence of the land and how that interacts with your field. Oh, just amazing. So it's, as I said earlier to you, it's on my bucket list if I can get there. <laughs> so thanks, yeah. John. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So, and we also, with the dreams and tracking, uh, we have the, the sand Bushmen who are reputed to be Everest. the oldest living indigenous tribe in the world today. And their culture is, is, is under threat right. uh, for a number of reasons. And, um, but we are very lucky to have their inputs and their skill and they're mm. teaching on the retreat as well. And um, I managed uh, this year to have an incredible experience with one of the elders, one of the sand elders, who asked if he could participate in the shrine tent. And um, this had never been done before. They had never asked to participate like like this. But then the retreat I'm offering is, is not being done anywhere else. <laughs> so... Um, so I said, yes, of course. And then he came with his family and community members. And there was about, there was about 10 of them. And, um, and it was so beautiful. But, and it, it, it actually culminated and it helped to bring, bring forth a vision um, that I'd had for many years for modern and ancient man to sit around a fire in a circle 
to revision our humanity. Mm. So it helped manifest this vision I've had for many years. And it happened this year after my seventh retreat in the Kalahari, it happened. Wow. And we were there around the shrine, around the fire, around the candle. And we practiced for three hours together. And as the ceremony came to an end, I, I shook the elder's hand, the cow, the cow is his name. And I gave him a gift of a Sangoma fabric. And then I looked outside the tent and there was this vulture that came flying low, low, low towards us. And then it came up. And the vulture is very symbolic and it represents new beginnings mm. and new life. And uh, so it's very exciting, very exciting. I'm still very excited. So you guys hear Gosh. this message and join us in the Kalahari. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. And what recognition as well of your own path and your own dreaming in manifesting mm. that, you know, that's a beautiful synergy. Thanks for yeah, sharing thank that. You. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah. Well, wow, John, I know we've only a little bit more time together and I just feel I would love to, to, to round this off and finish this off with some sort of a blessing or whatever wants to come through. Um. I know the power of sound and chant and uh, drum that moves through you from what I've heard is just such a powerful uh, blessing uh, to hear. So for anyone that's feeling called to John's work, please, please, please check him out. Go to his website. Um, he's, he's got his book there. I think you've an audio book as well and audio teachings and also retreats and personal sessions as well. Oh, yeah, beautiful book, Leopard Warrior. It's a bit it's fabulous. <laughs> uh, no, we got it. We got it. So uh, thank you, John. We'll put all the, the links for that uh, attached to this video. So, yeah, whatever you feel called. I'm just going to do a bit of drumming. So this is that my would be drum. great. Beautiful. It's hard to see it with the. What green. skin? What skin is it, John? I know um, that's a cow. Yeah, it's cow skin. Okay. Is there a significance with cow for the drum? Um, no, generally we just, well, I suppose cow is, is one of the sacred animals we use. Um, but also the skin is, is strong and that's what we tend to make the, the big drums out of. Right, right. Okay, so here's just a little chant, a little blessing right. chant. So just feeling your breath, feeling your heartbeat, feeling your nervous system and the blood and bones, and just breathe into the space of you, whoever you are, wherever you are. Just honor this, this special life that you've been given, the sacred life. And then... When I drum, I invoke the old people, we say, the ancestors, because uh, we wouldn't be here without them. So we invite our humanity to join us. We invite our people to join us uh, with a sense of celebration, like, uh, like a party, okay? And uh, where everyone is welcome, doesn't matter who you are, sick, healthy, old or young, whoever's on the other side that needs to come through, we invite you all through in the spirit of Ubuntu, in the spirit of humanity. And, uh, and when that happens, then we listen to the dreams. We see who's coming and what are they saying. Okay, so here we go. And when we say ancestors in Africa, we also mean nature spirits, okay? So sometimes the dreams we have are the dreams of animals and or the dreams of plants. Okay, so that's exciting. So here we go. Yabazali bamo bamo abazali bamo bamo yabazali bamo bamo Yabazali bamo bamo yabazali bamo bamo yabazali bamo bamo He wollen le lamen yange he wollen le lamen yange wollen le Le 
Feeling your heart, feeling your breath, and offering a prayer to your people, wherever they are, whoever they are, they are welcome into the circle. They are welcome. We say, Wamke le kile, amanyange, welcome to the ancestors. Wamke le kile, amanyange. Ngeda bantu, kuhamba pambile, ngeda bantu. Funda Ubuntu Bunzulu. Help the people to move upwards so that they can learn the teachings of humanity. Ubuntu Ubunzulu. So thank you. Thank you, John. Beautiful. I'm there with them. That's really, really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Just a precious gift for all that received that. And yeah, thank you for your presence today. I'm just very grateful, yeah, to make that connection. Thanks, John. Thank you. <laughs>